Greetings everyone everywhere, Laszlo Montgomery here with another CHP episode, part one of a multi-part series. Not sure how far this one will go, but I suppose we'll find out when we get to the end. Now, don't mind the show title. You know me, I always keep it simple, and rarely do I ever gin it up to try and get a few extra downloads, but uh, the teacup marketing department insisted, and so here we are. China's Himmler, an OSS operative, an old China hand, Oliver J. Caldwell, gave Dai Li that nickname. And all throughout his years as Jiang Kai-shek's secret police come spy chief, that's what people called him. And not to his face, of course. Dai Li always fancied himself as more of a Sun Tzu than a Himmler. Barbara Tuckman called Dai Li a cross between Himmler and J. Edgar Hoover. Heinrich Himmler? He was the head of the SS and the Gestapo, as well as the chief architect and mastermind behind the concentration camps, as Nazis went. Yeah, he was right up there with der Fuhrer himself. A terrible guy in all respects. Dai Li, he was a horrible man too. And in this episode, we're going to take a walk down memory lane and once again relive that time in China, 1920s, 30s, and 40s, when the entire nation was convulsing from every conceivable thing that could go wrong, plus natural and man-made disasters as well. He was born Dai Chunfeng, May 28th, 1897 had the same birthday as James Bond creator Ian Fleming, interestingly enough, and if I may add, America's former mayor, Rudy Giuliani. He came from Zhejiang, born in the city of Jiangshan, down in the southern part of the province, where it joins up with Jiangxi and Fujian. He had a rough start, father dying when he was four, always being hard up, living a classic, hard scrabble early life. He managed to obtain a basic, classical Chinese education, but by age 16, Dai Li's family could no longer afford to pay for school fees, and with that option gone, he left his village to try his luck 280 miles to the northeast in Shanghai. There, he joined countless others like him, living just enough for the city, surviving on the kindness and generosity of strangers, and in the first of a number of big breaks over the course of his early life, Dai Li fell in with Wang Yaqiao. Wang became an early mentor to Dai Li. He was a labor organizer and a very rough and tough sort who later went on to form the Anhui Gang. And this organization later served as occasional hatchet men for warlord Lu Yongxiang. Wang Yaqiao showed young Dai Li the ropes and introduced him to this lifestyle that existed as part of the seamy underside of 1920 Shanghai, if I may say again, so brilliantly introduced in Paul French's 2018 book, City of Devils. Under Wang Yaqiao's tutelage, Dai Li studied Crime 101, the master left a strong impression on Dai, who would later on go on to model his persona on Wang Yaqiao. In his day, late 20s, early 30s, because he was sought out so frequently by these warlords to carry out these assassinations of rivals, Wang became known in China legends as the Ansha Da Wang, the King of Assassins. He himself will later die by assassination in 1936, Thanks to Wang, Dai Li probably caught the biggest break in his life, falling in with the two most prominent figures in the Shanghai underworld, namely Huang Jinrong and Du Yuesheng, what Max Planck and Niels Bohr were to physics. And I guess you could say that's sort of what Pockmark Huang and Big Ears Du were to the Shanghai underworld. Dai fortunately made a good impression on Du Yuesheng, and I guess you could say that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And if you stacked up all the dead bodies who perished because of those two, they'd reach to the sky and back. And a young 20-something Dai Li began his infamous career as a gopher in the Green Gang organization. He knew that his future depended a great deal on ingratiating himself with these powerful and influential gangsters. 
He learned fast and had certain innate skills that allowed him to find favor with his bosses. Chiang Kai-shek, as we all know, was in deep with the Green Gang, and it was only a matter of time before Dai Li crossed paths with this up-and-comer in Sun Yat-sen's KMT organization. The two met in 1921, just a meet-and-greet, nothing profound. But Dai Li recognized that Chiang's star was rising, it's doubtful he made any great impression on Chiang Kai-shek. Along with the future Generalissimo, he also met two others who were older and wiser than he was. These were Dai Ji Tao and Chen Guo Fu. Dai Ji Tao was a fluent Japanese speaker, and because of that skill, as well as his journalism chops, he was able to get into Sun Yat-sen's organization. Chen, along with his younger brother, Chen Li Fu, was one of the leaders of the so-called CC clique of the KMT. You've heard of them. The CC, or Central Club clique, was a political faction of the KMT who, politically, eh, stood somewhere to the right of Genghis Khan. The brothers Chen were in like Flynn with Jiang because their uncle was Chen Chi Mei, best known as the mentor who gave Jiang Kai-shek his start and also as a major leader in the Green Gang until his assassination in 1916. Like with the case of Song Jiao-ren, Chen Qi-mei was another KMT politician murdered on Yuan Shikai's orders. Chen Li-fu would later on head one of the two main secret police organizations under Jiang. This was the CBIS, the Central Bureau of Investigation and Statistics, of the KMT organization department. Sort of like what the Gestapo was in Germany. And Dai Li, of course, would go on to lead the other, the Bureau of Investigation and Statistics, which acted as Jiang's military police. These two became rivals, even though they played on the same team, so to speak. Perhaps because they shared the same surname, Dai Ji Tao sort of took an interest in young Dai Li, all of 24 years old. These green gang heavies used to call Dai Li Xiao Biesan, which means something like, you know, little brat or little tramp. Of course, no one back then knew who they were dealing with, but they all got a first look at Dai's loyalty and his ambition. These chance meetings with the likes of Wang Ya Chiao and these KMT leaders did much to help the young Dai Li get his career started. Not long after, whilst living briefly in Hangzhou, Dai also had a chance meeting with another future influential KMT figure, and this was Hu Zongnan. Despite mixing with KMT and criminal royalty like he was, nothing was happening that allowed Dai Li to do anything more than barely survive on the streets of Shanghai. So he ended up back in his home village in Jiangshan, southern Zhejiang, And whilst in Jiangshan, he fell in with one of his friends from the area, one year his junior, named Mao Renfeng. And it was while attending Mao Renfeng's father's funeral that the two spoke. This was in 1926. Mao had joined up early at the new Wampoa Military Academy, established in 1924, with a little help from Sun Yat-sen's friends, the Soviets. Chiang Kai-shek served as the academy's First Commandant, his first big break on China's national stage. I guess we can thank Mao Renfeng for convincing Dai Li to pick up and head to the south of China to get in on the opportunities being afforded by the Wampoa Military Academy. And so, with a personal letter of recommendation from his former boss, Big Air's Du Yuesheng, in hand, Dai Li headed in the direction of Guangzhou and enrolled in the school. And it's at the Wampoa Military Academy, on the eve of the Northern Expedition to eradicate China of its warlord infestation, that Dai Li transformed from petty gangsta and gopher for mob bosses, and still named Dai Chunfeng, into something a little more serious and a lot more deadly when he changed his name to Dai Li. We'll come back to Mao Renfeng later, like his fellow Jia Xiangren, Dai Li, he ended up getting into the same business later on, and 
will be the one in 1946 to step into Dai Li's shoes as boss of China's spy agency. Thanks to a number of balls that took a lucky bounce for Dai Li, he was meeting all the right people and capitalized in some way from every opportunity. What ended up happening at Wampoa helped to set him on the course he ended up taking in life. He was reunited with Jiang, Dai Ji Tao, and other notables who would later join the top ranks of the KMT. Sun Yat-sen had just passed away by the time Dai Li showed up at Wampoa. At first, he began working for Jiang's secretary, Hu Jing An, who had given secret orders to Dai to suss out communists and leftists in the ranks of the Wampoa cadets. And he enthusiastically played a role in ratting out as many as he could, slowly learning his craft, infiltrating their groups, gaining their trust. And once again, fortunate for Dai Li, Commandant Jiang Kai-shek took notice and rightly saw something in Dai Li that he wanted to cultivate. And on March 20th, 1926, when the Zhongshan warship incident happened, a lot of his Nefarious spy work paid off, and Jiang was able to carry out his secret plan to purge the ranks of the Wampoa Military Academy of all suspected communists. This event, also known as the Canton Coup and the 320 Incident, was the first of several moments to come where Jiang proved, time and again, he was no friend of the communists, Chinese or Soviet, and he would stop at nothing to wipe them out. So with this purge of communists from the Wampoa Military Academy, that put the kibosh on the ill-fated First United Front that had been sponsored by the Soviets. It became a major milestone in the early stages of Jiang's career. And Dai Li had proved himself useful to Jiang, as he would time and again until his end came. Well, Jiang Kai-shek knew early on, no matter the circumstances, the communists were never going to be his friend. And he was right about that. Following the Chungshan warship incident where the CCP was put on notice, Jiang attempted to finish the job of putting the communists out of business in April the following year, 1927. April 12th, Jiang moved against them with some extra help from the Green Gang and followed this up with a bloody purge in every city where he had the muscle to do it. A few days following the Shanghai Massacre on the 15th, the White Terror spread to Guangzhou. Whatever communists or leftists who still remained at the Wampoa Military Academy, they were all purged. And Dai Li could pat himself on the back knowing he had played a role, albeit a small one, on fingering the cadets and officers who were not lined up behind Chiang Kai-shek. Many of those that Dai Li had fingered, were among the 300,000 or so killed in this major communist purge, both in Guangzhou and elsewhere. One thing, though, Dai Li never formally graduated from the Wampoa Military Academy, although he'll get to be called General Dai later on. He didn't have military credentials or the credibility required to be looked upon as one of them. KMT generals tolerated him, but they never considered him one of them. Despite his failure to graduate, Dai Li started marching in the direction of Shanghai at the start of the Northern Expedition, and when he got there, he let his guard down and fell back into his old ways, haunting all his old joints that he frequented in his early, out-of-control days. Not a good showing and Dai had to go to his mentors to see if they could get him off the hook due to his insubordination and lapse in judgment. In mid-1927, he tried to bounce back from this unsavory episode. Opportunity knocked again, and he was right there to seize the chance. This came after Jiang hit a political rough patch and had to resign his command. And this gave Dai a perfect opportunity to show his boss that he could Count on him, that he was a Jiang Kai-shek man. When Jiang made his comeback and was back in charge in January 1928, Dai Li continued to make himself useful by reporting any useful intelligence he picked up. 
Jiang was pleased with Dai Li and more and more came to know he could rely on him. And most of all, for someone like Jiang Kai-shek, he could trust him. And this was going to allow Dai Li's spying career to shift to the next higher gear. And this is where Jiang selects Dai to head up his military intelligence. As if Dai Li couldn't get enough lucky breaks, fortune smiled on him one more time when his path crossed again with Hu Zongnan, who was now a major military figure fighting in the Northern Expedition. Hu put Dai Li on his staff as a petty officer, and Dai was able to quickly parlay this position into something new with military intelligence. He had his sights set on a position that would put him in daily contact with Jiang Kai-shek. That's what he was gunning for, and it wasn't long before he got hired as one of Jiang's personal bodyguards. And Dai was relentless in his pursuit of not just communists, but any enemies, political or otherwise, of Jiang Kai-shek. He delivered time and again, and with a man like Jiang Kai-shek, with as many enemies as he had, real and imagined, Having someone like Dai Li, who faithfully had his back, it was worth something. In several instances, Jiang's interests were served by the dirt that Dai Li had been able to dig up. With every useful report delivered to Jiang, Dai Li's esteem grew. He was on the up and up, and as it often was in the business, with everyone always scrambling to curry favor with the big boss, Dai Li started to accumulate a lot of enemies. And despite never graduating from Wampoa and his less than stellar performance in the Northern Expedition, Dai Li had one thing going for him that far outweighed a job well done. He was trusted by Jiang Kai shek. And as this relationship quickly progressed, Dai Li rarely ever let his boss down. Time and again, running his agents effectively to rat out Jiang's opponents and anyone else considered politically unreliable. By 1928, it was safe to say that that lucky break he caught from Hu Zongnan, getting that start inside the military, had led to many chances for Dai to stretch his wings and chalk up a nice string of successes that pleased his boss to no end. But his ambition was radioactive in Jiang's colleagues and competitors in the world of military intelligence and spying began to eye him warily. Yet another in a long line of big breaks came for Dai Li in early 1928 when Jiang sought to create an intel operation called the Liaison Group, and he put Dai Li in charge. Dai put ten of his most trusted and talented men in place to run the group. All were Wampoa Military Academy grads, and these ten would, well, for the most part, go on to serve as Dai's most trusted agents as he rose higher and higher up the ladder of military intelligence. They became his his core officers. Not everything went well for Dai Li. There were times when Jiang gave him an important assignment, and, well, he blew it. And this was the case once when Jiang wanted the former Hunan warlord Tang Shangzhi rubbed out. Tang had joined up with Jiang's NRA to fight against the warlords in the Northern Expedition, but later turned his back on Jiang and allied himself with the Guangxi and Guangdong warlords. With Jiang's full trust and having proven his loyalty so many times, Dai Li's next step up was with a new organization Jiang created called the SSD, the Special Services Department. Their stock and trade was special services, but not the kind that you or I would ever need. What this SSD was, was the egg that hatched into the Secret Service empire that Dai Li ran with such effectiveness into the 1940s. During the 1930s, their main operating theater was the city of Shanghai, where the station based there mercilessly hunted down any communists infiltrating their cells. The headquarters of the SSD was in Nanjing, but Shanghai was where most of the action was happening. 
And into the 1930s, with every step closer, Jiang Mei to unchallenged political leadership of the Republic of China and the KMT, Dai Li was right there behind him. The 1930s was where Dai Li's rise went from quick to meteoric. This was especially true after Jiang was made head of the Military Affairs Commission in March 1932. By that time, Dai Li had managed to insinuate himself into Jiang's life to a degree matched by no others, enjoying unfettered access. You know the old saying about how you really know who your friends are when you're struggling? Well, Jiang faced another rough patch on his way to the top, and his allies were scarce. But Dai Li was working his agents around the clock to surveil Jiang's enemies and to provide his boss with much appreciated intel. But as the year 1932 progressed, Jiang was back in the saddle, outmaneuvering his opponents. And with no one to stop him now, Jiang took the liberty of calling for the consolidation of all competing intel ops into one single force. And in the early 1930s, so many different intel groups had been created, they were all stepping on each other's toes, and one was more zealous than the next to prove themselves to Jiang. But no one held a candle to Dai Li. As evil as he's made out to be by his critics and from historians, the truth remained. He was better than anyone else in the business. He never rested. And Chiang Kai-shek, being a results-oriented man and all, knew Dai Li delivered, and no one could compete with him in effectiveness. What slowly began to take shape was the spy agency that made Dai Li famous. This was the Bureau of Investigation and Statistics. Sounded like some boring department of a bureaucracy, something that sounded more like what you'd come across in an insurance company than anything else. This bureau would, in time, become Jiang's chief instrument of terror. Mind you, Jiang Kai-shek wasn't the only one in China organizing such intelligence agencies. Mao Zedong was doing the same thing. And as we'll see later on, the communists, time and again, schooled Dai Li with the infiltrations of his organization, not to mention the KMT also. Dai Li's counterpart in the CCP was, of course, Kang Sheng, someone covered in an ancient CHP episode from 11 years ago. Dai's league of 10 officers, who he had been grooming all this time, served as the core of this new department. They were involved in surveillance and investigating the military. And in his role as head of this bureau, Dai was given the rank of Major General, despite his deficiencies during his time at the Wampoa Military Academy. With the Generalissimo, one thing about him was that he felt you can never be too careful or too suspicious. So even more top-secret wheels were inserted inside top-secret wheels. One such top-secret group was called the Li Xing Shu the Society for Vigorous Practice. Only Jiang and his core team, including Dai Li, of course, knew of its existence. The Li Xing Shu was hidden from view. It was one of those things people heard rumors about, but no one knew if it really existed or not, or who was in it. The competition between the CCP and KMT agents it was reminiscent of the old Rock'em Sock'em Robots game of my youth. Dai Li ran a pretty formidable organization, and his agents scored time and again. But the communists, they learned from the best. And with common turn assistance and all the tricks mastered by the Soviets, these KMT organizations often got hit pretty hard themselves. They kept up a steady pace of just slamming each other back and forth. Any communist that got picked up was handed over to the SSD for interrogation, and they either gave up everything they knew and defected, or they died under torture. One or the other, the brutal war of cat and mouse played out between Dai Li's agents and the communists was an epic competition that played out with Close calls, narrow escapes, and brutality that knew no limits. They definitely got an A for effort. Dai Li's Shanghai Station 
gave it their all to squash the communists, or at the very least, persuade them to defect. Which often happened. I mean, it was better than the alternative. From previous CHP episodes, you may recall the marquee case of the master of disguise and former green gang banger, Gu Xuanzang. He went on to head up the CCP's secret service, but he was fingered in Wuhan in April 1931, and rather than go the uh, torture route, he ended up being flipped by Dai Li's agents and defected to the KMT. And soon afterwards, with Gu Xuanzang's help, thousands of communists ended up badly. But as we all know, Zhou Enlai, on behalf of the CCP, had almost everyone in Gu's family, including his wife's family, brutally murdered. Yeah, this was the kind of stuff that was happening all the time. It was just one atrocity after another. After November 1931, however, most communist operatives had left Shanghai's French concession and moved to Jiangxi, where Mao and Zhu De had set up their central revolutionary base, and that became the command center, and remained that way till mid-October 1934, when Mao led the communists on the long march to Yan'an, Shanxi province. The matter of torture? Dai Li's men had this down to a science. There were two main torture devices that were used to extract confessions. The Lao Hu Deng, or Tiger Bench, and the Dao Gang Zi, or Treading on a Stick device. No matter whether a confession managed to be successfully extracted or not, whoever ended up on either of those two instruments of torture would be crippled for life. No small number of communists picked up by the Shanghai station of the SSD suffered this fate. If you go on YouTube and search out the Tiger Bench, you can see for yourself how terrifying it must have been to be strapped into one of those devices. And just like today's corporations, who plow all this effort into R&D and always shoot for continuous improvement, so it was with these tormentors. They were always trying to improve their craft and come up with all kinds of innovative and brutal ways to make their captives talk. There was a standing order that basically commanded that anyone who refused to cooperate, if they didn't cry uncle when they were getting tortured, they were to be killed. You know, the kind of things that went on inside those rooms where the torture was meted out. It would really leave anyone shaken. One of the main sources I used in my research was Frederick Wakeman's spy master, Dai Li and the Chinese Secret Service. Wakeman reveals some of the things that went on in those chambers of horror. It's too horrible to even think about. And reading some of this stuff just makes your skin crawl. And it just kept going on, cover to cover. And it really colored how I viewed the whole period leading up to and during the Nanjing decade. It wasn't just men who ended up suffering these despicable acts. The ranks of Communist agents and members were full of women, too. And when they got rounded up or captured, they suffered the most sadistic and vile acts of torture. Rape was almost a given, but to countless numbers of women who had become fed up with the KMT and saw communism as a better alternative, Dai Li let it be known. Inside those interrogation rooms, anything goes. And this was looked upon as a kind of fringe benefit offered to the interrogators. As far as Dai Li viewed the situation, communists, patriotic Democrats, and anyone who didn't have anything good to say about Chiang Kai-shek, a man he was slavishly devoted to, they were all fair game to be taken down. And if they didn't see the error of their ways, they deserved to have their lives snuffed out. And this also extended to Dai's own people. If they ever let him down by falling down on the job or aiding the enemy wittingly or unwittingly, they too ended up badly, and not by lethal injection either. But back in the early to mid-1930s, when Dai Li was still on his way to making it, he ruffled a lot of feathers with his strong-arm tactics and aggressiveness. Jiang got a daily airfall from his relatives, the Songs, and all his other intelligence officers who had 
nothing good to say about the way Tai Li was running the spy operation that no one knew much about. The SSD reported directly to Jiang, and the other national security organs were separate. So it finally got so bad that it was starting to reflect poorly on Chiang Kai-shek. So we ended up caving on the issue of his spy master and reined Dai Li in a little. Chiang Kai-shek, taking a page out of the great legalists of the Warring States period, held on to power by controlling the military, the secret police, and the finances of the nation. For the first, he had Chen Cheng, Tang Anbo, and Hu Zongnan. For his secret police, he had Dai Li and Chen Li Fu, and to handle all his personal finances, as well as the finances of the nation, he had H.H. H. Kong and T.V. Song. H.H., H., of course, married to the oldest of the sisters Song, which also made him Jiang's brother-in-law. Okay, in this part one episode, I just wanted to introduce Dai Li to you. Where he came from, where he got his start, the historical people he mingled with, and the times he lived in. In past CHP episodes, we've spent plenty of time reliving the bad old days of pre-war Shanghai. Aside from everything else that we've looked at, both politically and culturally, I wanted to give you an idea of this bloody and dark side that was operating alongside all the history going on. Dai Li wasn't anywhere near the peak of his powers and ruthlessness, but next episode... We'll start to see him at his worst, so I invite you to come back for more. Once again, I hope you'll consider signing up for CHP Premium. Besides the pleasure of ad-free listening, I'm going to jam a whole bunch of other good stuff in there to leave you feeling like you got your five bucks a month worth. Just refer to the show notes and click on the link to check it out. It's one way you could support my humble efforts. Okay, this is Laszlo Montgomery once again signing off from Los Angeles, California, City in the Smog. Don't you wish that you could be here too? Think about joining me next time, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.